My name is Ron Walker. I'm the chairman of the Richard Nixon Presidential Foundation in Yorba Linda, California. And on behalf of the foundation, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the latest of the Nixon Legacy Forum, Nixon in the Court. This is the 15th in a series of forums examining the history and legacy of President Richard Nixon and his administration. And it is the first forum here at the National Archives. This spectacular home and the base are co-sponsors with the National Archives and Records Administration. Today it is my privilege to introduce the National Archives Executive for Legislative Archives, Presidential Libraries, and Museum Services, Dr. James Gardner. As his title indicates, his extensive portfolio includes the 12 presidential libraries, of which the Nixon Library has been a proud member since 2007. Jim is the first appointee to the newly created position, and we welcome him and look forward to working with him in 2012, which is Pat Nixon's centennial, and in 2013, which will be Richard Nixon's 100th birthday, and through all the years to come. Jim Garner brings more than three decades of experience with public and private organizations, including museums and libraries and archives. Before last August, he spent more than a dozen years at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. Most recently, he, has, he was the institutional senior scholar. He has also served as deputy executive director of the American Historical Association and director of education and special programs for the American Association of State and Local History. Please join me, ladies and gentlemen, in welcoming Dr. James Gardner. Thank you, Ron. Um, uh, I'm very pleased to be here this afternoon on behalf of um, David Ferriero, Archivist of the United States, who was unable to join us today. Uh, but it is my pleasure to welcome you uh, to the first of the Nixon Legacy Lectures uh, held here at the National Archives. Uh, the National Archives is a fitting place for such a forum because this building expresses and embodies America's commitment to keeping the records of our republic. Congress appropriated funds for this building in 1926, and Herbert Hoover uh, laid the, uh, the cornerstone in 1933, just a few weeks before President Roosevelt was inaugurated. The new president took a close uh, and detailed interest in every aspect of the archives, uh, from the design and construction of our building to the preservation and acquisition of our collections. And in June 1941, the first archivist, Robert Connor, went to Hyde Park to accept the Franklin D. Roosevelt Presidential Library and Museum as the first presidential library. Uh, today, with the addition of the Nixon Library in 2007, there are 13 presidential libraries in the uh, NARA family. Uh, if you do the math from uh, uh, FDR forward, you'll say there are only 12. Uh, there was later uh, the creation of a Hoover uh, Presidential Library. So Hoover is the uh, first uh, president represented in the um, uh, group of presidential libraries. The legacy forums uh, bring together the strengths of the archives um, and the foundation. We here at the archives and at the Nixon Library have all the papers and tapes and materials. And the foundation has many of the men and women who actually created them. History and memory. What we as historians can learn through research and analysis and the memories of the participants, uh, of the participants today in this forum. Uh, people who know what it was like to be there. And in the years to come, the videos and transcripts of these forums will provide invaluable information and insight for the scholars who come here to the archives and to the library, uh, Nixon Library to work and learn. 
Now it's my privilege uh, to introduce Jeff Shepard, who has played the central role in the planning and development of the Nixon Legacy Forums. Jeff is a graduate of President Nixon's alma mater, Whittier College, and of the Harvard Law School. After serving as a White House Fellow at the Treasury Department, Jeff joined the Nixon and Ford White House staff as an Associate Director of the Domestic Council. Jeff will open today's forum and introduce the participants. Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Hello and welcome. This will be the end of the introductions and we'll get to the forum very quickly. Uh, I have the privilege of helping produce these forums and, and it's a genuine thrill. We've done 15 so far and we have participation of at least 30 former members of President Nixon's White House staff in pulling these forums together, which is something of what we have today. The analogy is to the Civil War. We have all the documents from the Civil War, but no one sat down on camera and interviewed a particular general and said, well, why did you do that? Why did you go here instead of there? And we have this wonderful opportunity primarily because the next administration people were so young that we still, 40 years later, we still have the staff people who help produce the documents. National Archives has the documents. We have the people who help produce them. And what we get in what is largely an unrehearsed discussion it are insights and, and additional thoughts about why, why stuff was done or why stuff wasn't done. As, as you may know, the Nixon presidency is probably the most well-documented presidency in the nation's history, and it will probably remain that because no one else is going to take it. Uh, and, and you'll see one of the exhibits we have, and they, 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 they will come up on the screen, is a segment from one of the White House tapes. And I, I warn you in advance, it's exceptionally hard to hear. We haven't, we're really working on trying to get the sound right, but we've put the, the wording up so you can, you can follow it along and get kind of the context of what's going on. So with that, let me, let me welcome you and uh, uh, tell you what we have. We have a politician. We have three formal prosecutors, former federal prosecutors. Uh, uh, the group is two Democrats and two Republicans. And we have as our moderator an extraordinarily special individual that I knew from the Nixon White House, Fred Fielding. Fred joined the White House staff as, as one of the lawyers in 1970 became deputy counsel of the president in 72 through 74, and then he came back and served our nation as President Reagan's counsel, and more recently as counsel to George W. Bush. So with that, let me bring Fred out to be our moderator. Thank you, thanks for the very generous introduction, Jeff. Um, as you will see uh, when, you, when you meet the various guests that are here in the panelists tonight, uh, I like the part where he said we're all, we're all very young because, because we, we have, we're still around and we're still talking to each other and, and, and I hope you'll find that our memories are still with us as well. The subject today is very broad. It, it's really broader than just the president and Nixon's appointments to the Supreme Court because it really involves the long-range impact of those appointments and, and how it evolved. You have the people here who know were there, how it evolved, what, what, what the strategies were, uh, and can relate to the effects that took place as this court was put together, what we call the Rehnquist Court, was, was assembled uh, by uh, President Nixon. The format we'll follow tonight is, is rather simple. I will, uh, I'd like to give a brief introduction of each of the panelists. You've got, you have uh, bios handed out to you, I trust. Uh, and then each one of them will in turn uh, talk for six or eight minutes about their role and how it fits into our discussion today. And then we'll have an open mic, so to speak, and we'll have a discussion and that's where we really uh, hope to flesh out their views and, and their recollections of the events that we're going to talk about. But let, let me set the stage first. It's said that a president's most enduring legacy of a presidency 
is his appointments or her appointments to the federal bench and in particular the Supreme Court of the United States. And perhaps, uh, as you will see after we go through President Nixon's appointments, how that is really so. And it's something that he believed himself. And he actually wrote in his memoirs, I consider my four appointments to the Supreme Court to have been the most constructive and the most far-reaching actions of my presidency. So, the focus here today is just that. It, it's not just the four justices that the president appointed, but it's also the impact, particularly the impact on criminal laws and in, during the transition, if you will, um, from the Warren Court that began with Earl Warren as Chief Justice in 1953 to the Rehnquist Court, which began and then ended with his death in 2005. So as you will see from this chart, uh, it, it graphically sets out what we're talking about and, and the span of years and the influence that is concomitant with that span of years. And let me put it again into a little more context. Um, California Governor Earl Warren was appointed by President Eisenhower in 1953. And, and he served for 16 years as Chief Justice. And as the Warren Court's uh, decisions grew ever more liberal, particularly in establishing new rights for criminal defendants, uh, President Eisenhower, who had appointed him, was heard to say uh, that appointing Warren was, quote, the biggest damn fool mistake I ever made. Uh, but Chief Justice Warren uh, announced that he was going to, intended to retire in 1968 with the idea of giving President Lyndon Johnson the option to appoint uh, his successor. Then candidate Nixon urged him to wait until the election was over and then so that that would give the opportunity for whoever won the election, be it Hubert Humphrey or Richard Nixon, to make that appointment since Johnson was going out of office. He obviously declined to do that and he nominated his good friend, his former counsel and close confidant, Abe Fortas, who was already on the bench, um, to the position of Chief Justice. But ultimately that attempt was thwarted. There was a filibuster, we've, we've heard that word today, but it wasn't, it wasn't invented uh, today, it was invented back then and that filibuster kept that position open. So all of a sudden you have a new president and he has a huge appointment to make. And as we all know, Richard Nixon was elected in 1968 and he'd run on a law and order platform, a law and order platform that was openly critical of liberal judges and in general and the decisions of the Warren Court in particular. And so in May of his first year in office, the president named Warren Berger, who was then an appellate judge in the DC circuit, to be Chief Justice. And Berger served for 18 years, as you will see on that chart that just disappeared as soon as I turned to it. <laughs> the, uh, when they had that vacancy, shortly thereafter, Abe Fortas resigned. He resigned because of conflicts of interest charges that. Uh, and he left the bench. So all of a sudden, the new president had another appointment. And then came a series of nominations to, in fact, that have been very controversial in history and anyone who has studied the Supreme Court at all and the Nixon presidency at all is aware of the names of Judge Hainsworth and Carswell. Uh, they were both defeated after being nominated in order. Uh, it wasn't overwhelming. Uh, Hainsworth was 55 to 45 votes. Uh, Carswell was 51 to 45 votes. But nonetheless, the, the new president's uh, choices were rejected twice. And then the president named Harry Blackman as associate justice in the next year, 1970. And Blackman served for 24 years, but he was unanimously uh, confirmed. And, uh, but, so here's, the, here's a new president, if you put it into context, and all of a sudden, the next year, Justice Black and Justice Harlan both resign, both for ill health. And so suddenly, 
Here is the new president with an opportunity to put two more on the Supreme Court. And history will show that there were a number of people discussed uh, for those, those two slots. Uh, the names were Herschel Friday, Mildred Lilly, Robert Byrd, Senator Baker. Uh, a lot of names were floated around. The president actually appointed, nominated, uh, was, excuse me, was going to nominate and sent to the ABA for clearance, Herschel Friday and Mildred Lilly. The ABA said that they were not qualified. So he hadn't, he hadn't nominated them, but it was very well known that he had sent these names. And to fill those two slots, he then chose Lewis Powell, former president of the ABA and a very respected jurist, and William Rehnquist, a young lawyer working in the Justice Department who had the admiration of everyone who had dealt with him, but was basically an unknown in, in, the, in the outside of that immediate community. And Rehnquist was appointed in, and confirmed in 1972, and we'll have a lot of discussion about that today because the people who were involved are here. And then he was elevated to Chief Justice by President Ronald Reagan in 1986. And he clearly had the longest and, and greatest influence and impact uh, of, of our time. The Justice Rehnquist went on to the Supreme Court. He served for 33 years, uh, 19 of them as Chief Justice. And so when we talk about our discussion today, that appointment and the transition that the Warren Court to the Rehnquist Court, and particularly how it came about and the long-term impact, that's the focus of our forum today. Uh, I noted earlier that we're very fortunate to have with us today four people who were actually there way back when. Uh, three of them are federal prosecutors who began their career under Bobby Kennedy when he was Attorney General uh, at the Department of Justice, and the other one is a person who was to join Richard Nixon in his campaign staff as his first real appointee in 1965 and who spent uh, the whole election cycle through 68 and, and through the rest of the term of the president as a very crucial aide to, to President Nixon. Now you have the longer bios in your program. Just let me briefly introduce each of them. Pat Buchanan is now a public figure. He served three presidents. He's said three-time presidential candidate. He was 27 when he joined the fledgling Nixon staff. And he's also a key member, as I mentioned, of, of Nixon's White House staff uh, throughout the term of office. And as such, he's perfectly si situated to recount the Nixon campaign on the law and order issues and, and Nixon's efforts to name and appoint appropriate justices to the Supreme Court. Next is Wally Johnson. Wally joined the Department of Justice as a federal prosecutor concentrating on organized crime. He headed the Organized Crime Task Force in Miami, then became the minority counsel to the Senate Judiciary. And here comes the connection, Senate Judiciary. Uh, and then he went in 1970, became the Associate Deputy Attorney General with primary responsibility for congressional relations. And, and it's, it, Wally, from that position, orchestrated the confirmations of Justice Powell and Justice Rehnquist. Uh, and in 1986, I should add, as a private citizen, he came back and, and uh, helped guide uh, Justice Rehnquist through his confirmation as Chief Justice. And so Wally can share actual background experiences from his unique vantage point as well. Bob Bakley. Bob joined the Department of Justice as a federal prosecutor in 1960, also under Robert Kennedy. Uh, he later became chief counsel to the Senate uh, um, Judiciary Committee under Senator McClellan and, uh, and became now a professor of Notre Dame Law School. Uh, Bob is uniquely positioned uh, today to observe the juxtaposition, if you will, of the court decisions and the legislative activities that occurred as response and in response to these appointments. And last panelist is Earl Silbert. <laughs> Earl has spent 22 years in public service, primarily in the Justice Department, 
and in two stints at the United States Attorney's Office for the District of Columbia. In his first tour of duty, uh, he was the principal assistant U.S. attorney that headed the original Watergate prosecution. In his second stint, he headed that office as the United States Attorney. And uh, Earl's experience can provide a first-hand observation as to the evolution of the law and its impact on those entrusted to, to enforce the laws. So, in sum, we have two Republicans, as Jeff said, we have two Democrats. Poor Pat Buchanan's outnumbered by three former federal prosecutors, but I wouldn't worry for poor Pat Buchanan. And Pat, why don't you speak first? Okay. Fred failed to mention that three of us here have the high honor and personal privilege of being accused of being deep throat during the Watergate affair. <laughs> It was lies about all three of us, <laughs> right, Earl Fred? Let me talk about Nixon and the court and the origins of his policy. You know, I was an editorial writer at 23 or so in St. Louis, and the Goldwater campaign was on, and I was a big Goldwater right, and there was a heavy, heavy Goldwater contingent, and indeed it was a Birch Society contingent up in Alton, Illinois, where Phyllis Schlafly lived. And it was very, very conservative, and they had all these billboards attacking the Chief Justice of the United States. And it was so pervasive that when the fourth grade kids in the class at Alton Grammar School were asked, who is the, ch who is ch who is the Chief Justice of the United States, they gave Earl Warren's first name as impeach. <laughs> it was a blazing issue in 1964. And it became even more serious and grave an issue as 1965 and 1966 came around. The problem was basically, if you can name it as an issue, liberal judges and the Warren court. Warren, basically, Marshall, uh, Douglas, and Brennan, the four key members who were responsible for most of those decisions driving it. The decisions involved First Amendment rights and pornography, which unsettled the new majority. They involved crime. They involved religion and whether it should have a place in public schools. They involved issues of race as well. But the important one was that the, that the Nixon administration argued, and as we, uh, Mr. Nixon, as we're coming into this, the argument was fundamentally this about the Warren Court, that it is not deciding constitutionally. It is reading its own ideology into the Constitution. It is imposing a social revolution on this country from above that the American people have not countenanced and do not want. And the American people felt that way. In 1965 and 66, when I joined President Nixon, we zeroed in on the law and order aspects of the situation with the court. And the case was being made for us, candidly, in the streets. Actually, if you look back, that's when the baby boomers turned 18, 19, and 20, and that's one contributing factor to a dramatic almost doubling of the violent crime rate in America. There were riots in Harlem in 64, riots in Watts in 65, riots in Detroit and Newark in 1967. National Guard troops were called out in those two cities and in 20 other cities. It seemed like the country was coming apart. And then you had the revolt of the overprivileged on Columbia campus. That indeed added to this sense among the American people that their whole country, the country they grew up in, was disintegrating before their eyes. Walter Lippmann, who was the dean of liberal columnists at the time, wrote a column at the end of 1965 which Nixon picked up on. Lippmann wrote that the balance of power in society is shifting against the peace forces in society and in favor of the criminal forces in society. The establishment suddenly was getting worried about what was happening in America. Attorney General Ramsey Clark was the epitome, if you will, of a liberal attorney general. Even Lyndon Johnson was supposedly quoted as saying, Ramsey Clark would not arrest Stokely Carmichael if he caught him on the White House lawn with a grenade in one hand and a pin in the other. This was the son of Tom Clark. He was the quintessence of a liberal attorney general. And Richard Nixon used him as a foil 
all during those campaigns. Then what happened to America? In 1967, Nixon assigned me to write a piece for Reader's Digest. Had a fairly good circulation, 20 million. The largest magazine in the United States, the largest magazine in the world. A magazine had enormous reach in middle America. If you go back and get that article, you will see there all the themes and all the ideas and most of the verbiage that was later used by Nixon in the campaign and in his statements nominating Supreme Court justices. So I went out to all these folks, and Nixon was Mr. Law and Order. And then in 1967, there came the article in U.S. News and World Report. I was in control of Nixon's inbox in the law firm. In other words, everything he read would go through me, except for the personal mail, which went through Rose Woods. So this, I looked at uh, U.S. News and World Report. Here was an article by Warren Berger, who was a federal appellate court judge up in Minneapolis. And he had written a piece in U.S. News, actually it was a takeoff from an article he had done in the Law Review, which suggested he sharply disagreed with the decisions that had been taken by the Warren Court with regard to law and order and criminal rights. And so I got that into Richard Nixon, and it turned out Nixon and Berger had been friends at the 1952 convention. They had both worked for Dwight Eisenhower and against Robert Taft. Nixon, of course, got the vice presidency. So I sent that into Nixon all marked up, and uh, he appreciated it. And it was clear it stuck in his mind. And Warren, incidentally, as Fred said, Earl Warren knew what was coming. If we got the, Supreme, if we got the presidency, the Warren era was over as soon as we could name justices to the Supreme Court. So he attempted to preempt us by cutting a deal with LBJ. He went to LBJ and said, I'm resigning from the court, and, but he made it contingent on the approval of Abe Fortas as his successor. Now, as Fred said, Abe Fortas was a crony of LBJ's. He'd go into staff meetings at the White House. He was, he was also moonlighting. But we had one, one uh, issue, and I wasn't involved in it. The senators were. It was Abe Fortas had been on the liberal wing, the First Amendment wing, of all these pornography decisions. And some of them were really the, the stuff that they okayed was atrocious. So what happened was Bob Griffin and the senators set up a room in the U.S. Senate, and they got all the most salacious parts of these pornographic films, and they invited all the senators in, and they said, this is what Abe Fortas wants your kids out there seeing. And it was, people told me the senators were coming out, their legs were wobbling, it was so bad. But in any event, it was one of the things that fatally finished him, and so Fortas stepped down, and Thornberry, who was a crony of LBJ's who was going to replace him as associate justice, he was gone. So then we get to, let me see here. Oh, okay. Then we get to Fortis. We've already done that. Let me talk now in 1969, briefly do 69, 70. Uh, when Berger came in, Berger, I mean, when Nixon came in, Warren knew it was all over. So he stepped down as chief justice, and Nixon appointed Warren Berger, and I released to the press that wonderful article he had done in U.S. News and World Report, and that was the way he was presented to the American people as a real law and order justice. And I'm going to get step down now, but I think we ought to get into, and I hope we will, the other justices, Hainsworth and Carswell. One was treated horribly. The other maybe didn't deserve on, to be on the Supreme Court. And uh, my experiences with uh, the two of them and some of these other incidents that Fred's talking about. Statute run on those two, Fred? <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have a confession to make in front of Earl Silbert, and I wouldn't have done this 41 years ago. But I voted for Pat Buchanan every time I've had a chance. <laughs> <laughs> now, having said that, and with the background that my colleagues have provided, if you have ever watched a Senate hearing and saw the horseshoe of senators with the people behind them, I used to be one of the people sitting in the back of the room and ultimately found my way because I'm a creature both of the Justice Department and the Senate Judiciary Committee 
to being in charge of the Office of Legislation at the Justice Department. And I was taken by Fred's initial comment that in Nixon's biography, there's a line that is quite poignant to me. It's the only place in the book where he mentions the Supreme Court. The most significant aspect of my presidency was the four Supreme Court nominations. We've got Carswell and Hainsworth. I was in the back of the room. And they were beat up badly. Um, and for a variety of reasons, both of them failed. And here we are at a moment in history when Nixon has a chance to name two people. And there were lots of false starts. Uh, we talked about Herschel Friday, and we talked about uh, Mildred Lilly and the other possible candidates. Uh, I've listened to some of the tapes, and we have a unique opportunity to hear the way decisions are, decisions are made. It's, it's a lot like the old saying, watching law being made is watching like watching sausage being made. It's confusing. It's complicated. But the fact is, as I reflect historically on the last 41 years, the outcome was perfect. And what I want to talk about is how that happened. Uh, could we run that? During a four-year term, the President of the United States, sitting at this desk in this historic room, makes over 3,000 major appointments to various government positions. By far, the most important appointments he makes are those to the Supreme Court of the United States. Presidents come and go, but the Supreme Court, through its decision, goes on forever. As far as judicial philosophy is concerned, it is my belief that it is the duty of a judge to interpret the Constitution and not to place himself above the Constitution or outside the Constitution. He should not twist or bend the Constitution in order to perpetuate his personal political and social views. In the debate over the confirmation of the two individuals I have selected, I would imagine that it may be charged that they are conservatives. This is true, but only in a judicial, not in a political sense. You recall, I'm sure, that during my campaign for the presidency, I pledged to nominate to the Supreme Court individuals who shared my judicial philosophy which is basically a conservative philosophy. As a judicial conservative, I believe some court decisions have gone too far in the past in weakening the peace forces as against the criminal forces in our society. In maintaining, as it must be maintained, the delicate balance between the rights of society and defendants accused of crimes, I believe the peace forces must not be denied the legal tools they need to protect the innocent from criminal elements. And I believe we can strengthen the hand of the peace forces without compromising our precious principle that the rights of individuals accused of crimes must always be protected. I was a member of a major New York law firm, a senior partner. I have had the opportunity, both in government and in private practice, to know the top lawyers in this country and, as a matter of fact, some of the top lawyers in the world. And I would rate William Rehnquist as having one of the finest legal minds in this whole nation today. Except for the contribution he may be able to make to the cause of world peace, there is probably no more important legacy that a president of the United States can leave in these times than his appointments to the Supreme Court. I believe that Chief Justice Berger, Mr. Justice Blackmun, by their conduct and their decisions, have earned the respect not only of those who supported them when I nominate them, but also those who oppose them. And it is my firm conviction tonight that Lewis Powell, 
and William Rehnquist will earn the same respect, and that as guardians of our Constitution, they will dedicate their lives to the great goal of building respect for law and order and justice throughout this great land. Um, about a month ago, I began reading a book that was published about a month ago called Nixon's Court, written by a political scientist named uh, Kevin Mc M McMahon. And I said to Pat as we were coming out here, everything you believed and argued for in the 60s came true. Now, our focus is law and order. We're three prosecutors. And Bob and I work together on the Senate Judiciary Committee Criminal Law Subcommittee. So we're focused in this conversation about law and order and the consequences of the appointments to the Supreme Court. In reflection and after 41 years of experience, finding the two nominees together, Powell and Rehnquist, was an accident of history, but a brilliant move to realize the philosophy that President Nixon articulated. My story starts when I was Associate Attorney General, and I know I've got a limited amount of time, so I'm going to go fast. And I was a junior official at the Justice Department running the legislative office. That meant basically that I connected with the Congress on anything that had to do with um, the Justice Department and, and uh, mostly the Senate Judiciary Committee, because that's the Oversight Committee. And we had these phones with great big red lights on it, so when the Attorney General picked up the phone, it would bong at you. And my phone bonged, <coughs> and it was a day that Nixon named Rehnquist and Powell, and it was Mitchell. And Mitchell said, Bill needs a lawyer. Well, Bill needed a lawyer because what Bill had done for Carswell and Hainsworth was to be their lawyer. And Bill was a brilliant, brilliant lawyer. He was an advocate. Most of the analysis you read of his personality and um, uh, the way in which he operated, he was, he was a brilliant guy. He was an advocate for Nixon's programs. And he was even regarded, and I heard this in a conversation between Haldeman and Kissinger, and Haldeman said, he's even more right than Buchanan. <laughs> <laughs> the fact is, I've read analysis that suggests he was a judicial activist. And basically what happened in this evolution from a criminal justice standpoint, now my colleagues will discuss this, we see this pendulum move. I worked for eight attorneys general from 1965 to 1975. And there was an atmosphere where between Ramsey Clark and Mitchell, the pendulum moved. And part of it was naming people like Rehnquist and Powell. Now, I've heard broadcasts, and maybe we'll play one later, where they're described as very similar. They were very different. They may have been similar in philosophy, but they were different in personality. Justice Powell, or Mr. Powell then, perfect gentleman, very highly regarded in the bar, um, uh, a senior partner in a major firm, sort of at the tail end of his career. Bill Rehnquist was 47 years old, uh, used to sit in a recliner in his office surrounded by law books. And I can picture him, and I think, Fred, you've seen him there, too. He had a bad back. And he had to lean back in his chair, and he couldn't, he was always in pain. And he lost himself in those law books. Now, the chart that's up is basically what most people don't think about. And if you have read your history in this era, what you'll hear about is everything that went on until Rehnquist and Powell were named. You'll hear about the Bar Association, and you'll hear about Lilly, and you'll hear about uh, Friday, and all the clutter. But the fact of the matter is, not many people talk about what happened in the confirmation process. 
what happened in the confirmation process is we were, remember, we were in a democratic Congress, but the Senate wasn't lined up around parties, they were lined up around philosophies. And we were in an atmosphere where Republicans didn't hold and the Southern Democrats, conservatives didn't hold for the two nominees. Uh, they bowled it, and there were reasons for it, because they're basically, if you think about this from a strategic standpoint, and again, I, I won't waste, I won't sp spend much more time. There's three ways in which to block a nominee, and this is all before the era of borking someone. It's a transition era. There are three ways to do it. You can show they were unethical, Fortas and Hainsworth. You can show they were incompetent, Carswell. Or you can show they engaged in dirty tricks and they tried that with Rehnquist. Didn't stick. So basically, the combination of Mitchell, Eastland, and Horoska held together the coalition in such a way that we were able to move very quickly through this process. How did that happen? And I'll leave you with an insight that basically has never been presented before. We linked the two candidates in such a way that the grand support for the very gracious Lewis Powell pushed Rehnquist forward. Anytime you see these two nominations discussed, it's the Lewis Powell and William Rehnquist nomination. The hearings for, the votes for. We always kept Powell behind Rehnquist. Who did that? Jim Eastland. Because substantial pressure was brought by friends of, William, uh, of, of uh, Lewis Powell and enemies of Bill Rehnquist to separate the two. We heard that Birch Bay initiated a filibuster, he couldn't pull it off because he didn't have the votes. But the fact of the matter is, delay worked against Rehnquist. So my thesis, which I'll leave for us to ponder later, is basically if those two had not been together and Lewis Powell had not been such a gentleman because lots of pressure was put on to separate them. And I remember one story in I think I've got it pretty close to accurate. I get it secondhand from the senator. James O. Eastland, some of you may remember him. He was a giant. He was a man of no words. He didn't talk. But he was elected to the Senate the year, the, the Senate the year I was born in 1939. So he's sitting with Lewis Powell and he said, you know, lots of people want you to be senator. You know why? And Powell said, well, I'm not sure, Mr. Mr. Eastland. He said, because they know you're going to die. <laughs> <coughs> Rehnquist was 47 years old. And they knew that they, the people that didn't want him up there, the people that opposed him philosophically, knew that he was going to be there a long time. And we talked about three decades. He was there from 1971 through 2005. And what Bob will discuss is what happened because of that. And I've got more to say, but I'll pass we'll, the we'll baton. We'll come back to you. I want you to come back to me. We will. Okay. Well, you must feel like Chief Justice Hughes. He had 26 voting against him, too. Is that the exact number? 52 to 26. I just got it in front of me, so you can go out and say, well, I accuse, I had 26 against, but you had 68 for. Gee, you're a much better. Yeah. There's only one thing, though. I've just damn near withdrew your nomination before because I uh, was talking to John Connolly, and he showed me an article by Joe Kraft endorsing you, and I said I've made a mistake. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I can't tell you how much yeah. I appreciate your giving me this opportunity. Well, this is a great thing uh, for to have a, such a to be such a young man to go on the court. Uh, you'll make a great record, and uh, you know the very fact that. Uh, the only thing, I'll, I'll give you one, only one last bit of advice because you're going to be independent, actually, and that is don't let the fact that you were under heat change any of your views. You know, I'll remember them. Don't ever let, I told Warren Burger that. I said, no, Warren, uh, you know, because uh, he didn't get much heat, but I said, just don't come down here, I, the way I put it to him. And uh, uh, let the Washington social set change it. Well, so, uh, so, if, so just, and rough as I said you were. Okay? Thanks, Mr. Brown. All right. But just good luck. Thanks Bye. A lot. Bye. And sure.
show the picture. <laughs> the long era of liberal domination of the Supreme Court may have come to an end today to the names of conservative justices Berger, Blackman, Powell, and occasionally conservative Justice White. That of conservative William Rehnquist was added today when he was confirmed by the Senate after five days of debate. We have a report from ABC Capitol Hill correspondent Bob Clark. Liberals, led by Indiana's Burt's Bay, had tried vainly to convince the Senate Rehnquist was unfit to serve on the court because of his record on civil rights and individual liberties. But when Bay moved to put off a confirmation vote until January, he was resoundingly defeated. Majority Leader Mansfield called for final action today. Bay agreed, and Rehnquist was approved 68 to 26. The no votes came from 23 Democrats, only three Republicans. Liberals and conservatives had different views about what it all means. Senator, what happens to the Supreme Court when you add Rehnquist to the other Nixon appointees? Does it take a sharp turn to the right? I think so. I think so. I think uh, there's no question if Mr. Rehnquist's earlier stated views are inculcated into Supreme Court decisions, the Supreme Court is going to take a sharp turn to the right. I think you're going to see a court now that will reach decisions that will be favorable but they'll be reached on the Constitution and not on a book of sociology. Whether the Supreme Court will now take the sharp turn to the right that liberals fear is a question for the future. But four of the nine justices will now be Nixon appointees, conservatives close to the strict constructionist image admired by the president. Together they may extend Mr. Nixon's influence on America's image and American history far beyond his own years in office. Bob Clark, ABC News, Capitol Hill. And this was when the commissions were presented about 10 days after the con confirmation vote. And the reason I like this picture so much is it captures the strength and integrity of the philosophy moving forward into the court through two excellent partners for the future, which sets up my colleague, Professor Blakey, to talk about what that was. Former Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill, used to say that all politics is local. That hasn't been my experience. My experience is all politics is personal. It's connections, people that you know. Uh, I worked in the Department of Justice. I was uh, a Democrat, and I was a liberal. And I never voted for Pat Buchanan. <laughs> <coughs> but I will say that um, shortly after the assassination of President Kennedy, I returned to Notre Dame to teach. And one of the things I taught was criminal law and criminal procedure. And I went over systematically the opinions of the Warren Court, and I had known as a prosecutor that these opinions blocked me from investigating very serious crime, and in some situations let some very serious criminals go free. And I didn't find any receptivity in the Humphrey campaign to talk to him, but I did from the Nixon people. I first met Pat Buchanan in 1968 in San Diego, California. There was a, a meeting to discuss the, pres the President Nixon's uh, attitudes, and the position that I advocated was that we had to change these things. Some things were constitutional and they'd have to be done by judges, and other things were statutory and they could be done by legislation. When the campaign was successful, uh, John Mitchell and Dick Kleindienst, who became the Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General, asked me to come to New York and meet with them at the Hotel Pierre and go over the Department of Justice the various sections and divisions and the personnel was there and to make recommendations to them. And I did that. And then they offered me a job uh, in the department. 
I turned them down. And I turned them down because I had already promised Senator John L. McClellan, who was a Democrat from Arkansas, that I would help him process some legislation. And anything that I say about what I did in the department, I mean, in, in the Senate, is not me. It's John McClellan. John McClellan was the guy I talked to all the time. He knew what I was doing. I didn't do anything he didn't approve of. And it was his unique position in the Senate of respect by all of his colleagues that if John said something, it would happen. And McClellan, so I worked for McClellan. I worked to him initially to put the federal wiretap statute through. That gives a court order. You can put in a wiretap or a bug. Symbolically, Ramsey Clark refused to use it. Uh, several years later, I was involved in the investigation of the death of Dr. Martin Luther King. And I came to the conclusion that had they used the wiretaps at that time, it would have been effective in the investigation of Dr. King's death. But to make the long story short, as part of this panel, I tried to put together seven illustrative, not exhaustive, opinions where one thing was done by Earl Warren and another and contradictory thing was done by either Berger, uh, Justice Berger, or Justice Rehnquist. If I could have the, the list. You can see that they're in parallels. On the left side is the Warren Court judgment. And on the right side is the Rehnquist judgment. And one thing that's true in these is they're not wholesale overruling of prior decisions. They're really an interpretation uh, of the prior decision and ultimately the Constitution that's more nuanced. The first one, and I won't talk about them all, they insist that I not be a law professor, because uh, I could go on for hours. Uh, Terry versus Ohio dealt with a very significant question is, what is the relationship between the police and people on the street? When can police officers come up and talk to them? And can they protect themselves uh, when a person may be armed? And the Warren Court said, yes, maybe, but it's got to be a violent offense, and you have to have personal knowledge of what's going on. When the same question came up before the Rehnquist Court in Adams, which the next one over, they recognized that law enforcement is not just violent offenses. It's across the board. You couldn't narrow it that way. You had to give it and that most police activity is not personal information. They depend on another policeman that tells the policeman that tells the policeman. And as long as the information was corroborated, you ought to be able to act on it. And that's an example of what they did in case after case. And I could go through these. You can read them later. But nuanced decisions to go one way or another. Uh, when I was in the Department of Justice, it was the Warren Court's opinions that tied my hands. I have to honestly tell you that since that time, while I am a law professor first, I'm occasionally a consultant. It's too late for me to consult on the prosecutor's side, so I consult on the defense side. And now I'm finding that it's the Rehnquist Court opinions that are tying my hands in defense. So I don't think the only thing that's consistent in all of this is that Blakey loses. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So this is not only a matter of <coughs> decisions on the Constitution or legislation. Uh, before President Nixon became the president, the Congress in 68 put through the wiretapping statute. After he came in, he took a very strong position on organized crime. This is an example of the personal aspect of it. You all hear about legislation being put in here and then processing a committee, it going to joint conference. What happened with this one bill at least, the Organized Crime Control Act, the president knew what Senator McClellan was going to put in. And Senator McClellan knew what President Nixon was going to say. And one of the reasons that, that they both knew is because I was personally involved in drafting the president's, I didn't do it all, people in the Department of Justice, the president's statements. So these things were worked out together. The president comes down endorses this legislation. The legislation ultimately goes through the, the Senate. And then it was important to get it out of the House Judiciary Committee. We used to call the House Judiciary Committee the Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> Everything goes in and nothing comes out. There came a point in time when the issue was raised in the White House. I get this second hand because I wasn't there. Do they make an issue in the next election, which is typically done about the do-nothing Congress. And instead, the guy I worked with in drafting the statement for, for the president stood up and said, no, this is on the merits. We should participate in discharging the House Judiciary Committee. House Judiciary Committee was he headed up by Manuel Seller from New York, very liberal wanted to change everything in the bill or deep six it. And what we were able to do, we meaning Senator McClellan gave his staff to Congressman Poff in the House. It was like unheard of. And so the staff work done for Congressman Poff was done by Senator McClellan's people, which meant the bill when it was processed in committee was being cleared with Senator McClellan all the time. We got it out on the floor and we passed it. And then it came over to the Senate. And Ben Zelenko, who was the chief counsel of the House Judiciary Committee, called me to set up the conference committee. And they figured they'd kill it in conference. But what they didn't know is we'd already had our conference. We had it with Congressman Poff. So we took it and sent it directly to the president. We never took it in, in the conference with, with the additional votes. Why? We had already done our homework, and President Nixon signed it. Uh, I was in the Department of Justice when he did, and he signed a bill, and he handed it to Mr. Hoover and said, go get the crooks. And I can tell you that that legislation, at least in the organized crime area, has made an enormous difference. In 1963, there were approximately 5,000 members of the Mafia, La Closa Nostra, or whatever you want to call them. They had 22 families. Today, there are about 1,500. And the families in all the cities except New York are basically destroyed. And in New York, of the five families, there's probably only like one and a half in operation. And who's responsible for that? Richard Nixon, John McClellan, and Roman Horusco, who Wally Johnson worked for. That represented the Republicans. We represented the Southern Democrats. And if we sat down and worked with Senator Mansfield, we had the moderate Democrats and that passed the legislation. And how was it done? Personal relationships <coughs> with, between the senators and personal relationships between the staff members. And it wasn't Democrat, wasn't Republican. 
It were people looking at a problem, figuring out what had to be done, and then doing it. I wish they'd do that now. Okay. Earl? Uh, thank you. It's been, very, it's been fascinating uh, to me to listen to my uh, three colleagues uh, describe um, uh, their uh, uh, experiences as, as they have. And, and what has brought my attention most is the aspect of the contrast between what was going on in the U.S. Attorney's Office, which is where federal prosecutors trying murders, rapes, and other uh, types of crime, uh, with uh, those in the political arena or, and, uh, and or on the Hill. Because in the, in the U.S. Attorney's Office, as a federal prosecutor, I worked there for 15 years, nine or 10 years as an assistant U.S. Attorney, five as a U.S. Attorney, not once, not on any single occasion did anybody ever ask me what my party affiliation was, and frankly, they didn't know. And that would be true of my colleagues. I myself, with respect to those who applied to be in the office, those who served in the office, I did not know what their politics were. And frankly, I didn't care. We were, and, and, and the reason for that was to try and keep out of the day-to-day -day prosecution business or day-to-day -day investigation uh, business any uh, potential assertions or claims to the extent that you could that there was political motivation or there was this kind of influence or whatever it may be and to keep it just straight and narrow down the middle regardless of party or the like. So that uh, what I'm about to describe to you in, in reaction to some of these court decisions is not based on was it rendered by Republicans, was it rendered by Democrats or a combination, what it was was what, what mattered uh, in any decision was the merits, merits of the case, the merits of the uh, evidence that had been accumulated or gathered with respect uh, to uh, an, any uh, alleged violator who was under, uh, under investigation. And as I said, party was an irrelevant uh, consideration, never came up. Now talking about, uh, so we were in a way because that's not the real world necessarily, uh, we were kind of in a cocoon. It was a protected cocoon, and one that I happen to believe uh, quite strongly was, a, was an appropriate cocoon, and that uh, it, once you start allowing political or other considerations to come in to prosecutive judgments, you're going down the wrong road and can uh, perpetrate uh, uh, injustices. Now, what we've been talking about and on this issue with respect to protecting the individual rights and liberties of, of accused of criminal charges, and we're contrasting that with public safety. And uh, as Wally Johnson indicated, he used the uh, analogy of, of a pendulum swinging back and forth. I, I just think of it in terms of a balance. It is the responsibility and duty, in my view, of a of the prosecution <coughs> it is their, res uh, their responsibility uh, of the prosecution to try and draw as best he or she can an appropriate balance, taking due consideration to the need to protect the constitutional and other rights of the accused, but also taking into due consideration the very important rights of the public to be safe and secure in their homes and on the streets and where, where they work. And in the middle to late 60s, 1960s, I was a line prosecutor. I was simply trying cases that came in all kinds, whether it be murder or, or armed robbery or burglary uh, or the like. There was a perception on the part of my colleagues and I, not a political perception, but just based on fact, that there were, that at this period of time, the Supreme Court was tilting toward protecting more the rights of individual, uh, of those under, uh, under investigation or who had been indicted at the expense of public safety. 
And that was also true to a degree with respect to the circuit court uh, in uh, the U.S. Court of Appeals uh, in the District of Columbia. As I say, there was a concern, there was an unease, there, there was a sense that this is what was happening and that the law was changing and the law was changing in a direction to grant even more protection to those who were under investigation or under, under charge, again at the expense of the, uh, of, of the public. And indeed, uh, it was imperative important uh, for us, we were told, as line attorneys, you have to read uh, the opinion. The Supreme Court on Mondays announces its opinion. You've got to read them because there may be something in any one or more of the cases they decide that has an influence and will an influence impose requirements, restrictions, and limitations on uh, your ability to prosecute successfully cases in court. And when on Thursdays the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit comes down with its opinion, you get to read those carefully to, make, to see whether or not there are new uh, restrictions, new uh, limitations that are being imposed on you. And, th and that, again, uh, created a, uh, a concern about the lack of, of balance. Now, there are some, and there were political comments made, there were co comments that were made at the time that this, this shift to overprotection, uh, alleged overprotection of those uh, of the accused was perhaps leading to an explosion in crime because at the time, in, in the District of Columbia, the nation's capital, there was a heroin epidemic, and that meant a lot more crime was being committed by addicts who needed to force their habits, burglaries, <coughs> robberies, uh, uh, and, and, and the like. And it also, there was a, uh, a apparent increase in organized criminal activity, be it the mafia, be it drug cartels or labor uh, racketeering. And there were some that were make, trying to make the connection between the two. That is, that the uh, increase in crime uh, of the kind that I've just described was attributable uh, to these uh, decisions and, and to the new restrictions <coughs> and the impediments uh, that were being put upon federal prosecutors. Well, I could never myself, frankly, make that uh, connection. From the day-to-day -day cases that I was handling, uh, and as I said, they included uh, robberies and murders and burglaries uh, and the like. I couldn't make the connection that I was losing out on cases or having cases that were good cases slip through my hands and losing them in court or at an earlier stage in the prosecution uh, because of some of these uh, opinions. But, I st but we still, notwithstanding that, had that sense that the pendulum, to use uh, Wally's expression, or just the imbalance that I am talking about was there. And so when the president made it clear that he was interested in uh, uh, selecting judges who would be receptive to arguments being made in behalf of public safety, that that gave some kind of comfort uh, to prosecutors that what had been out of balance, hopefully, that was going to be, the lack of balance was going to be restored and that there would be an appropriate balance drawing the line as close to the middle as one possibly could. Now, I want to follow up on what Bob, uh, Bob Blakey, Professor Blakey had to say with respect to this. The administration, when it came in, uh, as I say, we were down in our cocoon trying our cases and a rape case under one attorney general is not really different than a rape case under another uh, uh, attorney general. If you have the evidence, you prosecute as a federal prosecutor and do the best you can um, uh, to, uh, to prevail. But what struck me as a line assistant in, in the years of uh, the Nixon administration was what Bob has described, and that is the by Bipartisan, bipartisan effort and a very successful effort to pass legislation that would confront and, and deal with the problems being raised by an increase in organized criminal activity. The statute that Bob was talking about at the end of his, his talk 
which he didn't identify as the RICO statute, it has to do with racketeer influence, corrupt uh, organizations primarily, that was Bob, and he made an enormous contribution because that statute was directed direct was directed well specifically at dealing with the mafia in organized crime, and 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 as he has described, really led to the accomplishment a remarkable accomplishment in reducing the uh, challenges that it produced. Also. Uh, in terms of tools, with the increase in organized criminal activity, it became essential for law enforcement to have available to it the tools to investigate. RICO gave, by criminalizing certain conduct, it, it provided uh, <coughs> a di an additional basis on which to predicate uh, organized crime, uh, criminal prosecutions. In addition, Bob has mentioned the electronic surveillance. The Supreme Court had knocked down a statute in New York that provided for electronic uh, surveillance, wiretapping, bugging, and, and the like. And Bob analyzed and ass assessed the defects that the U.S. Supreme Court had pointed out and in turn produced a statute in conjunction with the Department of Justice that passed. And was, it was very controversial at the time. It was opposed on grounds that it would intrude in the privacy, the constitutional privacy areas of protection that the Constitution gave. And nevertheless, the statute passed, it has been used, and now we take it for, second gra we take it for granted that it will be used in all kinds of investigations of organized activity. Similarly, in attacking organized crime and, and uh, organized criminal activity, there was at that time no statute that provided for the ability to gain the testimony of co-conspirators providing immunity to have lower level people testify against those who were uh, higher ups. Statute was enacted to pass, I mean a, a legislation was passed to provide for that kind of immunity. A critically important uh, provision in the fight against uh, organized criminal activity and again Bob and Senator McClellan, through that, his committee, the Subcommittee on Criminal Law and Procedure of the Judiciary, passed that legislation. It withstood attack in the, uh, in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court affirmed its constitutionality. And that statute, not today, is taken for granted and is part of the arsenal that a prosecutor like, my, uh, like I was, used to be, uh, in, the, in the U.S. Attorney's Office would be able to use. And so uh, in that, I really uh, uh, commend, uh, and, and, but the significant part here, I'm sorry, was the fact that it, it was a bipartisan uh, uh, project, a bipartisan effort on the part of the Nixon administration and uh, the Democrats uh, through Senator McClellan's committee. <coughs> As you can see, we have... Uh, quite an interesting panel uh, full of a lot of interesting stories and a lot of knowledge of the subject matter today. I'm mindful of the time uh, and there are just a few things that I would like us to go over to kind of fill in some gaps if we may uh, in, the, in the time remaining um, and especially talking about the confirmation process and a little enhancement on that. But th th there's been a criticism over the years that uh, President Nixon, really, when he first started out uh, after he had named the Chief Justice, when he had the Fortis nomination, that he, he dealt with it differently and that he didn't, he didn't take it in the serious vein that it, that it should have been and therefore we had the Hainsworth and Carswell situations occur. I think that, uh, that Pat and Wally, I would wish that you all would, would deal with that question and how it uh, came about. Well, when Hainsworth was nominated, he was the chief judge of the Fourth Circuit down in Richmond. Distinguished jurist, one of the attributes he had was that the president said, because so many of the decisions coming down affect the South, I'm going to get a constitutionalist from the South and put him on the Supreme Court. So he was chosen right after the Berger nomination to replace Fortas, who had resigned in something of a scandal. And he was torn to pieces. And in a way, I think it's one of the most unfortunate and unfair things that happened in that time 
because he was a good man, a solid man, fully qualified, a traditionalist and a conservative. But then we followed up with uh, G. Harold Carswell. And Nixon, or Haldeman used to, the president would ask Haldeman who would call me, and he would say, okay, we got another judge, Pat, and I want you to call him up, and I would talk to the judge, interview him, get materials from him, write up the press release, and drop it out to the press corps so that the press corps would have to pick it up and run with it. And then they would say, look, this is a conservative jurist. And Nixon supported another one. So I called Judge Harold Carswell, and I regret to say I said, Judge, have you written any articles like Burgers? He says, no, I haven't written anything I can recall. He said, I said, how about some decisions of yours that you're particularly proud of that give your philosophy? And he didn't have anything there either. And so I said, let's go into the war record. And so we wrote that up, but when we went up there, I knew he was going to be a problem because it did not look like he was, seemed up to that standard. And so the, the, the Democrats, uh, Birch by and the rest of them, tore him apart and rejected him. And Fred had the numbers on that. And when they did, the President of the United States was smoking. Uh, he called me, he didn't call me, Haldeman called me, says the President wants you to write a statement <laughs> and on tacking these, these, the Senate Democrats and bring it over to the Oval Office. I naturally assumed I'm writing a statement for Ron Ziegler to release in the, in the press room. And so I get over to the Oval Office and the old man's reading this and he really liked it. And he said, okay, let's go. And he takes off for the press room hmm. and reads this statement himself and the next day a backup statement called this an act of regional discrimination against the South, that you will not confirm a Southern judge. We put two up there, and since you're not going to get them confirmed, we're not going to appoint another Southern judge. We'll appoint someone else. And so they went to Berger, I think, and got the name of Harry Blackman. And so that was, well, <laughs> I don't know what, how he stands on law and order, but he's had some problems. But anyhow, that's what, uh, that's what happened. And I will say, the fellow that said he was working for Roman Harusta here, yeah, he didn't help us, Wally. <laughs> <laughs> what he said, uh, he was up there, and, and people were saying, well, Carswell seems to be awfully mediocre. And that was a line. He's mediocre. He's not up to Supreme Court material. And Senator Ruska said, don't mediocre people deserve representation on the court? <laughs> <laughs> it was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't think it was a joke the other day. But I will say this. Well, and we got out of that Harry Blackman, who was one of the Minnesota twins, they called him. But I do think in terms of, of Nixon's political strategy, uh, it was a triumph. I mean, he, all these folks in the South said, look, they keep beating up these two guys who are Southerners. They got one of them the head of the Fourth Circuit. The other one's on that circuit down in Florida. And so I think people got the impression that the liberals had taken over the Democratic Party and they didn't give a hoot <coughs> about the southern wing of the party. So it was successful politically, but uh, again, the result was less than uh, some of us would have liked. Let me move the conversation a little bit, but also within this same framework. 41 years later, I can count that vote. There were 100 senators, and we worked every one of them now. It was an atmosphere of change because, as Pat clearly points out, the president believed, and every president that I've read about before Nixon believed they had the right to nominate Supreme Court justices. It was, a, it was inherent in the presidency. But what was happening during that era is the Senate was beginning to feel its oats. And two distinguished law professors, one from Yale and one from Harvard, wrote articles, and they were both philosophically liberal, which fueled this flame and allowed the senators to begin to think they had an independent obligation. When I talked about the three reasons they would argue against a candidate, integrity, competence, and what I call the dirty tricks, those were excuses. What they were really doing is fighting to keep people of a different philosophic bent off the court. And that's what was going on here. Now, I'm looking at the, uh, 
here's the atmosphere, and Pat colored it perfectly. Because Carswell and Hainsworth were beaten up. And if you look at the Democrats and you look at the Republicans, we were in a Democratic Congress. And what happened with Rehnquist and Powell was that the Southerners and the Republicans and the moderates held together. 68-26 isn't perfect. There were five senators that didn't vote. And they all, I looked at uh, uh, the list earlier today, they all would have voted for Rehnquist. But the fact is, we were scared. We didn't know we were going to win that vote. And when you see the picture of President Nixon with uh, 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 Powell and Rehnquist smiling and laughing. I mean, this was a major triumph. Yeah. And that evening, after the 20th, I was there. Mitch, Mitchell and I weren't in the picture. We deserved to be. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the president called me at home. And he was, later that day from Camp David, he was still bubbling about how excited this was. How exci it was because this was a major, major triumph. And I'm back to what happened in 66, 67, 68, 69. This was one of three major political issues. Mm -hmm. Law and order, that's all we're talking about today. There was desegregation and there was crime in the streets. Mm -hmm. But basically, I think he framed a political campaign that aligned the Senate around that coalition of moderate Republicans mm -hmm. from the Midwest right. and the, the conservative Southerners that Bob right. has been talking about. You're talking about the new majority. And they slicing, stuck together. Slicing, all, slicing off the northern half of ethnics who tend to be socially conservative, mm -hmm. economically more moderate, and the southern Protestants uh, who tend to be very conservative and frankly who like big government in a lot of ways. And the whole idea was the Democratic Party of FDR was as we called it a collection of warring tribes that had come together in anticipation of common plunder. <laughs> the the, the hey, party, the party, <laughs> but the party we had to. Our party was in '64 was about half the size of the Democratic Party. I said, "Look, we are the Confederate Army. If these guys get together, <laughs> we can't win." And so we worked and worked and worked, and we said, "Who are the people we can get?" And we said, "There's Northern Catholic, Empire, frankly, like my father, Al Smith, FDR Democrat until the court packing, and all the fellows I grew up with, and then the Southern fellows who were very conservative." They said, what's the matter with, you know, her, you know, what's the matter with Clement Hainsworth? Perfectly distinguished judge. And so those things helped us so that in 1972 we got to 61% mm -hmm. of the vote. Mm -hmm. And we're, I looked at Birch Bayh's picture. He tried to mount a filibuster. There were basically four people on the Judiciary Committee, Phil Hart, Ted Kennedy, uh, uh, Birch Bayh, and John Tunney from California that lined up against Rehnquist philosophically. And they struggled to find something that would stick. If we couldn't hold Powell behind Rehnquist, they would have isolated him. And it's just like, I live out in Wyoming now, the wolves would have hounded him down. And they tried right up to the last minute. Their filibuster was just as long as the one on Fortis, almost five days. They couldn't hold it. They couldn't hold the votes. And that's basically, uh, what I call the rest of the story. We were able to hold those Southerners, Southern law enforcement, I think of them as law enforcement people built around John McClellan. Uh, uh, the Southerners would follow McClellan. There's even a memo in the hearing file that Blakey wrote on wiretapping. And I called him and I said, what, do you, what was this all about then? Well, law and order was a big issue in that confirmation hearing. And they were looking for things they could pin on Rehnquist and hound him down, and they didn't get away with it. Let me, uh, thank you very much. Let, let me ask a quick question of everyone on the panel, and then, then I've got one final question. Uh, we all know, uh, as, at least as observers, that since Bork, confirmations have become quite different. Mm -hmm. uh, but Wally, I think that you experienced that a little in, in 86 with the Chief Justice confirmation, it was coming then, um, that you recall that there were issues in, in, in 86 that mm -hmm. were raised that weren't raised in the original confirmation here about Justice Rehnquist. So the question to each of you, and there's no right or wrong answer, could Rehnquist be confirmed today? 
Mm -hmm. I, think, uh, I think the answer to that is yes. I think you could get enough uh, conservative Democrats so that if the Democrats go down this road of rejecting, he's number one in his law school at Stanford. He's a distinguished individual. I think they would have, they went after the dirty trick, so-called uh -huh. after it. I think he probably uh, could get confirmed in this Senate, and he certainly will be able to be confirmed after 2012 when we get the Senate. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd, add, I'd add a quick anecdote, because in 86, Bill didn't think he needed to have a hearing. They can look at my record, but of course they went after him anyway. Yeah. I'm not sure he could. It would, the way you put it, 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 could he be confirmed, I assume, you mean as Chief Justice, yes. when they had the opportunity to see how he was voting yes. and, and doing it? And I think it would have been extremely close. You know, let me close. make a point. He was one of two that voted against Roe v. Wade, and that would be a horrendous issue for if, if, if he were asked about that, if he couldn't get around that, and he said he were against it, I think the Democratic Party would really unite as one to try to stop him. Yeah, well. Pat, you're a little more political about this than I was when I was up there. Many things went down on what I thought was the merits. Wally had a point about the moderates. <laughs> Senator McClellan would figure out what he needed to be done. And then I would sit with Senator Haruska's man, and that would give us the Republicans. And then I had to go uh, to Senator Mansfield's people. And that gave me Southern Republicans, Southern Democrats, the Republicans, and the moderates. And that was on the, on the issue, not, not the politics. The, the, the people, the moderates here, Southern conservatives, Republicans, you could do anything that made sense, but you couldn't do anything that didn't make sense. And it was the opportunity to talk to people, not politically, on what the sense was that meant, uh, in retrospect, I like to think of it as the like the golden age of the federal criminal law, where the things that, that, that had seemed to be needed, uh, in particular in the Department of Justice under Robert Kennedy, where Wally served and I served, uh, we found we needed, we needed tools. We couldn't get the work done. And then subsequently, uh, through Senator McClellan, that stuff became law. And it didn't become law for Democrats or Republicans or liberals or conservatives. It was because it was the right thing to do for the United States. And I think that's a, a singular achievement. And, and Nixon gets a bad name sometimes. But in fact, he was participating. You, you couldn't do it without him. It was a third of the country. I mean, a third of the politics in this town. But to have the Senate and the President, Department of Justice, and a substantial number of people in the House of Representatives together on the merits of something is maybe what we don't have today because people are too political. Pat. <laughs> well, as I explained, Fred, at the outset, I've really had no uh, significant contact of any kind in the, in the political uh, atmosphere, so I defer. Uh, to others and really can't contribute anything I think I would consider particularly meaningful on whether or not the Chief Justice would be, uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist would be confirmed. But I do endorse and agree with what Bob Blakey just said about uh, the uh, singular uh, joint effort, bipartisan effort to address uh, individual issues that impacted the ability of, the, uh, of, the, of both of the Congress and then of the Department of Justice to investigate organized criminal uh, conduct that was plaguing uh, our country. And I, gi I give both Republicans and Democrats, you know, I think they, they came together on those important issues uh, for the American people, and I think they deserve credit for that. Let me tell one short story that ties in with uh, Earl. We have rules of evidence that deal with procedures in court, and a very select committee 
proposed a set of rules of evidence. And my senator came in the office one day and said, can I look at this? And I, of course you can look at it, Senator. He took it home and came back, and he was livid. He had been a prosecutor. And these things were being proposed. And I just mentioned one to you, that after the trial was over with, you could interview jurors. And if the jurors said certain things, you could overturn the verdict. And McClellan says, I've had hearings on the Black Panthers. You could never get a conviction of a Black Panther that would stick because the community would come in and change the juror's mind. So one of the things I did is I sat down and went through, or I didn't like, I took notes from Senator McClellan, and I sat with Earl's people. What will this do to you in the Department of Justice? And we put it all together, and <laughs> Senator Ruska and Senator McClellan introduced a bill to abolish the Rules Committee. And that got their attention. And the three people um, who were principally in charge of it, Judge Maris and a lawyer from New York and the law professor came in. And the law professor was arguing the merits. And uh, finally, the other two realized that without Senator McClellan, they weren't going to go anywhere. So they asked, asked for what we want. And basically, we got it. That's because I could pick up a phone and call, call Earl. That's partly personal, but it, it's the fact that people were doing merit. What ought to be done? Not what ought to be done for the next election, but what ought to be done. Uh, and I don't see that. I said that three times now, but I'm going to say it one more time. But that's what I don't see in my politics today. <coughs> we we uh, unfortunately have run out of time, but are there any closing remarks, that either Pat or Paul? Well, I'll just say, Bob, that we had to win that election before you could the great job and do those great things. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Jeff, I know you have some closing words, but thank you all very much, and thank you, panel. <laughs> He's got, a, he's got a closer. Uh, our 16th forum comes to a close, uh, a matter of personal observation. Uh, while I spent five years on the uh, domestic council at the White House, and my public policy focus was the Department of Justice. These are my best friends. Uh, they're here only because I asked them to be. I was uh, uh, doing public policy work, and uh, one of the great sources of creativity was Bill Rehnquist. He headed the Office of Legal Counsel. It was the constitutional lawyer. Uh, for the White House, for, for the executive branch. And we'd go over and talk to Bill all the time about ideas. I mean, that one of the reasons he had trouble getting confirmed was he'd write memos about how we could do this or we could do that. And I called up, well, this five-day filibuster was going on, and I wanted to, to pick Bill's mind on, on uh, some particular topics, and I called his office and said, can I come over? You know, I don't want to interfere. He's up for confirmation. And his secretary said, oh, please come over. You know, he can't do any work. He's just beside himself with the uh, confirmation and the filibuster battle. So Bill and I are there together, and we're talking about gun control and whether you could concoct a statute to reduce gun violence without upsetting issues of gun control. And we're really focused on this. I mean, this is going on for 45 minutes. And the phone rings, and his secretary says, uh, uh, Mr. Rehnquist, the Senate has just voted to confirm you uh, 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 to be a member of the Supreme Court. And Bill turns to me and it says, well, you know, Jeff, in, in light of this, I think we should cease the discussion because what we're working on may become, may, it may come before me, you know, as a, as a member of the Supreme Court. So I, I had the fun of, of being involved with, with all these people and, and with Bill Rehnquist, and, and I got more out of this, uh, this forum than, uh, than I think perhaps you did. But this is typical of our forums. Unrehearsed, open discussion. Uh, we're going to have one on December 5th. Same place on labor issues. I hope you'll think about joining us. Thank you for coming.